Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Obviously, uh, we're to the next phase of what our exploratory committee was okay. the, um, charged to do, and it's uh, interesting and uh, gratifying to see some uh, documents coming forth that show that people are doing their homework, which is uh, a good thing because uh, they're all so highly paid that uh, to actually get homework out of you is, uh, is a good thing. <laughs> and, um, so, um, with that, I mean, we'll get right to business. I know people are busy, and, and we've got uh, obviously some reports coming forth from our subcommittees, and we can just go right down the agenda and, and get started. So, Levi, are you the finance reporter today? I, I, yeah, I'm the chair, um, which is great. Leaves me with reporting our deliverables that are are somewhat updated from from last time we met. There, there are still a few things that we talked about in the last meeting that are um, our question marks, but <clears throat> as it stands right now, some of the expenses that are that are coming up, and our, our goal here for this meeting, at least to deliver to you guys today, was to try to put together a timeline of expected <coughs> expenses, most of which are unknown. Some are starting to become more known. Um, the first expense that I think that we're going to incur, and, and most of you are, are aware of this, would be the marketing, um, which is going to be the idea of, of getting this thing off the ground and, and really ramping it up for a, a, a possible um, announcement of moving forward in, in March. And, and right now, we've had a, a budget put together. Lori was uh, able to put together an estimated budget of what that would cost to basically put together a spot. And she'll talk more about this, uh, about the details. But the estimated budget on that is $130,000. Um, the next expense that we see coming down the line and it's going to continue from this day forward is, is events coming up and supporting those events and, and what that's going to cost as far as our input to those, whether it be um, opening ceremonies, if we, if we try and do something there, if we try and start to, to join forces with other um, winter sports events that are going on, any, anything that we're going to contribute there, which also could um, kind of catapult into a uh, revenue generating thing as well if we're going to sell products there or whatever we may do. The next, the next expense is the USOC bid, of course, which is in 2015, which we don't have any idea of what that the cost of that is going to be yet. Hopefully, we'll have a um, more firm number in, I'm, I'm thinking March, is that when they're going to start to put that? I guess we don't know yet. But the USOC has basically removed the process for bidding for the future games because they're revamping it. Um, so once we get that in line, we'll, we'll have an idea of, of what that amount will be. I'm sure there's going to be some sort of candidature fee, just like there is for the IOC. Um, from there, some other big expenses will be, and this will be an ongoing process, but will be venue development. <clears throat> and I'm looking for input from our venue committee on, on that aspect. But those will probably just string along until if the bid comes up and we're able to host the games, we're going to have several of those come up along the way. So I have no estimates on either of those. It just depends on which venues we're going to be looking at, if we're going to try and start from scratch, if there's going to be overlap of other venues that are coming up <coughs> that are um, being bid on to, to be built. So we'll, we'll, get, we'll basically start to fill that void here once we get more information. Then, of course, the two big expenses leading up to the IOC bid, which is in 2017, if we are able to get the USOC bid, there's a $150,000 acceptance candidature acceptance fee, which is due to the IOC. Um, and then after that, two years later, there's the IOC candidature fee, which is $500,000, and that's in 2019. Um, aside from that, there's going to be a lot of other expenses. We're just trying to basically build a timeline and then fill in the gaps right now. So it's a work in progress. The, the next thing that we discussed uh, were possible revenue sources. Of course, if we're going to have a lot of expenses. We need to look at possibility of revenue, hopefully. Um, and of course, donors and sponsors are, are a big one there. And we put together what we would call a preliminary hit list of companies that we're going to be looking at. Um, companies like Verizon, Intel, uh, some of the cruise lines, Aramark, um, Coke. There was, there was a few other ones as well that just were bouncing around of, of people that we want to target. Once we have a, a good marketing packet put together and, and really a, a firm decision on what we're trying to accomplish and how to explain that to these, these companies, whether it is actually bidding for the Olympics or making ourselves a more viable winter sports city. Um, another thing that came up, which actually was, was a, we thought was a great idea, was the grocery store, what they call the Roundup. 
and I'm sure you've seen it for breast cancer, but if you spend, you know, $20.50, would you like to round up to support, in this case, you know, the AOC or, or Anchor's, Anchor's bid effort? Um, apparently, that had a possibility of generating, if you get Fred Meyer and cars on board, almost $100,000 a month, um, which seems substantial to me. Um, Carol Frazier reached out to Car Safeway, and um, I didn't get the gentleman's name, but she said the, the head of Car Safeway in Alaska, and he said that he was fully on board once we've made a decision to move forward with that. Um, I'm assuming... It's probably Glenn Peterson. It, it, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure who she didn't say who that was, but she touched base with him last week. <coughs> Fred Meyer we haven't connected with, um, but I think we're, we're going to probably touch base with them to make sure they'd be at least be on board. But that would be a huge revenue source, not only you know, a decent dollar amount, but it's also continuous cash flow, which it will be necessary through this process. Now, we're not, the idea is that we, you know, condense that down into certain time frames. I mean, we're not going to do it for 15 years, obviously, um, but, you know, trying to rip on people. Um, one other thing that came up, this actually came up in the accommodations meeting, is the possibility of increasing a bed tax um, in support of, of this. And that was brought up by Julie and um, and Carol, the idea that, that they did something similar to that uh, for the convention center. Um, and and that would also, uh, I guess, if it's something that's voted on, that would see if we had buy-in from the community as well. <laughs> so these are just, we're just brainstorming about different areas to, to raise money. Um, some other things that I put together, aside from our specific bid, but trying to get an idea of what previous games cost and the revenues generated from those and, and all this information if you guys have been online clicking around I mean there's there's numbers flying around everywhere so I tried to con consolidate them into a, a format that was easier to understand and I just got that and send it out. I just get that oh yeah you took <clears throat> So I, I just looked at the previous winter games, not not summer games because they're a totally different ballpark. Um, looking at Nagano, Salt Lake City, Torino, and Vancouver, breaking it down into, into obviously revenue and expenses, but breaking the revenue down into different sources: broadcast, Olympic partner sponsorships, um, domestic sponsorships, ticketing, licensing, and then government contributions. Let's start with uh, Nagano. They were able to, not including the government contribution because that was not disclosed, they were able to generate $654 million in revenue from all of those different sources. The funny thing about Nagano is there's no expense reports available and there's no government contributions available. And the story behind that is there was corruption and all the documents were destroyed. Um, so I'm assuming that they were not in the profitable area. Otherwise, that probably would have been um, more prevalent information. But moving forward, Salt Lake City was a great story, a, a great story about uh, domestic sponsorship. I say a great, great story. We know there was corruption going on there in, in a few different areas. But as far as putting together what they called the, um, was it Olympic Properties? Uh, the Opus is what it was called. And it was a domestic sponsorship drive that basically was the most successful US sponsorship setup. In, in history of the Olympics for the U.S. Um, and they were able to raise actually 500, almost $600 million doing that with domestic sponsorships. Um, they also raised through broadcast $445 million. Uh, the Olympic partners, which are the, you know, the large Olympus, um, Coke, the, the partners each year that, that donate in kind and cash, they raised $132 million. Um, ticketing was $183 million. A big expense that they had that actually doesn't show up as a line item was uh, anti-doping and security, and the government actually covered both of those, and it was about three hundred fifty million dollar price tag. Um, they covered both of those. Yeah, they put the well, they covered yeah direct coverage of expenses of three hundred fifty million dollars by the government to cover the. I, I believe it was the overage of security that they didn't anticipate because of the nine eleven event. Was it and, just federal government? Or was it state and federal? Uh, it's it's quoted as federal government. In fact, there's a letter that Romney wrote to the federal government, but I don't want to say begging, but explaining why they needed... Uh, right after 9-11, makes right. sense. Mm -hmm. 
Levi, what's the difference between uh, uh, a domestic partnership and then those partners like Coke? And <clears throat> yeah, so there's there's two to see. There's there's a group that's called TOP, the Olympic Partners, and it's set up. The last one was set up of of nine. Um, did I bring that? Yeah. Of nine companies that are throughout the world, or I'm sorry, not nine, but let's see there. How many was it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ten companies throughout the year. Um, right now, the current partners, or for the last Olympics, was Coke, not familiar with this brand, but Eidos, Dow, GE, McDonald's, Omega, Panasonic, P&G, Samsung, and Visa. And so what happens is they <coughs> give donations in kind as well as cash, and that goes through the IOC, and then they distribute that accordingly to the Olympic cities. Now, the the other revenue that would, would be domestic sponsorship, I assume, is coming from also in-kind and cash, but from uh, companies, in this case, it could be Coke, that's not on this level, but on more domestic level for us, you know, it could, Odom Corp could get involved sure. or, or anything like that, um, but it's not set inside in the contract for the Olympic partners. Um, that's a good question, though, and I can find out more details. Probably just not the official Olympic right presenting sponsors mm -hmm. yeah and they have a, and this this doesn't change necessarily every year but it's right. not the same companies every single year um and they have a contract with the ioc of of what they're going to get for that olympic spot, um, partnership as well right uh, i think that the funds from the olympic partnership go to the u.s olympic committee as well i mean that's that's where a big chunk goes yeah it goes to the international uh, the IF and then it goes to the USOC and and the OCOGs or, or whatever that that's that would be us is the um, organizer yeah the organizing committees. I was going to mention that there there is a, a in the federal government uh, budget there is a, a uh, an area that normally covers international sporting events that you can get monies for those since 9-11 it's really been increased a lot for the Arctic Winter Games we got probably Six hundred fifty, seven hundred thousand dollars for the oh, wow. games just on the security piece. Okay. Um, whether and they actually sent staff and everything too with it. So okay. um, that that's just part of doing business now, unfortunately. Right. You got how much money? Close to seven hundred, seven hundred fifty in kind. Yeah. Holy cannoli. In so is that when you say in kind? Are they sending? They sent bodies. They sent equipment. Mm -hmm. They they did all the cameras at every one of the facilities. Then we had a, uh, a central location um, in our main ops center, which probably had, uh, it was staffed with four people, four Homeland Security people there the entire time um, with all the screens and, and everything. Then they also put the black boxes in every one of the vehicles that were heading up the highway because you can't lose uh, transmission, especially between um, Homer and uh, Girdwood. Um, so they have this black box that they, they installed in, hmm. in all the buses and a variety of the other vehicles and stuff. So, and, and it was one of those things that we didn't have to deal with it. You know, I knew the numbers, but we never saw a bill for it or anything. The feds just came in and, and, and took care of it all. And I think that's similar to what happened in Salt yeah. Lake City because yeah. it doesn't show up on their expense or revenue yeah. report. And then they sent, they sent in, you know, the, we had a U.S. Marshal's office. We had, we had Homeland Security. We had, Every customs, everything was was located right there in Kenai okay. for us. So, hmm. so, so, they, so are they doing that for Fairbanks this year then too? They're doing some things for Fairbanks, um, especially because the the um, coming right off of the Olympics in Russia. Mm -hmm. So yeah. good, thank you. Um, moving forward, Torino was a little bit different. In fact, um, Torino ended up being under I'm, I'm assuming i can't find the government number but they had a gap of about two billion dollars of difference between what their expenses were and the revenue outside of government um input that i could find one of the big reasons their ticket sales were well, this wasn't this was impactful but their ticket sales were the lowest of of any of the winter olympics at the past four years or the past four times as well they sold 80 percent of their allotted amount whereas vancouver sold 97 percent um, another huge expense for them is they spent $2.1 billion on venue development. That was larger, comparable to Salt Lake City, spent $285 million, uh, and Vancouver spent just over $600 million on venue development. So um, I don't know where we sit in that area of the amount that it's going to cost us for venue development, but I, I would assume we're 
got to be somewhere in between, um, possibly more than Vancouver because they had a lot of things in place. But I can't imagine we're going to be at the two billion dollar mark for that. Um, the, uh, those are the, the big takeaways. Um, I mean, venue development was a big area where we could save money, and it sounds like from a, a report that was sent out from the IOC, um, a direction that they're trying to go is looking for more affordable hosts for the Olympics. In, in my opinion, that was my interpretation. They want to see uh, cities utilizing current venues that are already in place, not doing what Sochi's doing and starting from the ground up and building an Olympic city. Um, so well, hopefully that all plays well into our hands, but we won't know finance-wise until we really have an idea, get a grasp of, of what it's going to cost. I think the, the first and foremost, most important thing is what is it going to cost to even bid this thing? And then from there, um, you know, we'll have to keep moving down the road. I think that, oh, what did I have? Next steps. So some of the questions that did come up, and these, these would be up for discussion, and hopefully we'll get some answers, but um, when we start raising money and start, we, we obviously aren't spending any money yet because we don't have any money yet. Um, I mean, we are moving forward with, with some marketing things, and hopefully we'll, we'll bring to light how that's being done expense-wise and how that's being funded. Um, we talked about getting the AOC up and running, and that, that could be a place that this money that hopefully we'll start coming in the door, we'll, we'll start to go to, but it sounds like we may have hit a hiccup there a little bit because I think it's going to be delayed getting it set up and maybe there's some more information there. I was hoping that um, Chris was going to be here, but he's, he's not, so we'll try and figure that out um, because we wanted to get a procurement process. You know, once the AOC is up and in place and running, uh, we're going to have to have a process in place of how we, you know, put things out for bid if we're going to do things or, or, or however that may work. We just want to make sure as a finance committee we're dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's um, before we start allocating money. Um, like I said before, we want to start gathering information about venue costs, event sponsorships. Event sponsorships, I think, is, is going to be a big one that comes up here soon because that's a good way to get the word out about what we're trying to accomplish, what we're trying to do, and get positive impact out there or a positive influence out there for the city. Um, I don't know about you guys, but every time I mention the idea to somebody uh, without them knowing that I'm involved in this exploratory community, I say, yeah, how about the city trying to you know, get the Olympics the first thing? They kind of laugh like, oh, that'll never happen. We can't handle that. People just don't have any idea. And maybe that's true. I mean, I, I personally don't think so. I think that we have the ability and, and the infrastructure and, and all the resources that we need to do it. I think it's going to be challenging. But uh, we really need to make it a focus to get the word out there, a positive, in my opinion, a positive um, word out there about the Olympics because there's a lot of naysayers out there, I guess. So, um, And then the other thing that we're going to try to do as a sponsorship committee or as a um, finance committee is get sponsorship levels in place. So once we do approach these companies to give money, we want to have different tiers of, you know, whatever it may be, platinum, gold, silver. Go ahead. Somewhere in the archives of the AOC, we had all that stuff. You did? Yep. The, the procurement processes? Yeah, different levels. And oh, you did? Okay. Right. Okay, great. Actually, that was one of the things that we talked about, hope, hoping that we could find those documents. I hope the documents are still available. I think Chris is still looking for them. It sounds like we may have a, a Nagano repeat here in Anchors. I don't, a, know, I don't know what. There's a tremendous uh, uh, amount of resources at the library. You can go online and just look at the archive list. It's all of Rick's. Yeah, actually, Rick Meister put, and I've put a lot of things in okay. there. Okay. I mean, Chris's documents are from probably Ernst and Winnie uh -huh. as our accounting firm. And I'm not sure, you know, if those were ever sort of part of our office, but I think almost all of our office is somewhere at the library. Okay. I wonder if there'd be a duplicate of those statements at the library. Um, he, he's aware of those deposits at the library, but I, I'm not sure if there's some documents that he needs that involve that involved in resurrecting the um, nonprofit. Yeah. And he was not able to locate them a week ago. I right. haven't heard back from him yet, so that's on hold. And, and most of the research we've done so far from our internal was at the consortium library at the university, right? Yeah. Not at LUSAC. Right. <clears throat> so I don't know if they're duplicative or if they're. No, I, I'm, I'm sorry. It is at uh, the AMIPA and uh, <coughs> the consortium library. 
Okay. Where all that stuff is. is that what you were talking about, Lori, or are you talking about Lucet? Uh, well, because I heard your stuff was Lucet, but, yeah. but I'm not sure. We should probably have uh, <coughs> one of our interns go start doing some. Yeah. NSA San Diego spent a fair amount of time researching that. And I'm not sure what the what the I mean. It feels like on the on our committee that there's a rush to get the AOC set up because we we want to make sure that everything's done right with money coming in and going out, but. I, I, I guess I'm looking for feedback here to make sure that that is um, right or if we aren't on a time crunch to, to get that set up. Yeah. I, I would say that um, we would get, be getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. Okay. I mean, until we're only a, a couple months away from a blower no go um, recommendation. And so uh, I think we have to be a little bit cautious about uh, putting too much resource or too much energy into, you know, setting something up where if the answer is no, then you put a lot of time and resource into something. So, right. and we'll talk about it with marketing too, because, uh, you know, right now under the auspices of the city, we obviously have to be very cautious about money that is spent. But once it, we decide that it's a go, if that's the decision, then things can happen fairly quickly in terms of setting up, you know, the structure of an organization and implementing a game plan. So conceptually, I think a lot can be done, but, um, you know, we're not a we're not a uh, fundraising organization. Right. We're simply a, um, a review and report organization at this stage, and so we've got to be cautious not to that makes sense. get a little bit too far ahead of ourselves. So, uh, particularly if we spend a lot of money and the decisions are no go, then we just set ourselves up for an awful lot of criticism. There's obviously, um, you know, at the assembly level, there'll be people that'll you know, make it an issue. So anyway, we just gotta gotta pace ourselves for for this stage. So, that makes sense. so very good. That's yeah. That's a that sums good it up. report. So. Um, Lori, marketing, PR. Okay. Uh, well, we've had several committee meetings and um, put together a basic uh, plan to move forward just for the next ninety days. And one of our first tasks was uh, we had a big discussion about what it would take to uh, to really get that confidence among the residents that Levi was talking about is, you know, how do we convince them that we can manage these games and, and that the, the time is right again. And so um, uh, we looked at um, some branding options for uh, what our sort of our iconic look would look like. And, and also we looked at a theme, what would communicate that. And in the, um, the, the fiscal side of things, we didn't want to start over. We had the terrific logo from before. We just basically refreshed it. We used the, the, the that iconic flame and snowflake. Uh, but we did put some time into a theme. And um, we went uh, the whole gamut from, you know, being proud of our city to, you know, it, it, the time is right. And, and was this about the athletes? Was it about the economic development? And, um, and we uh, went the whole gamut, too, on, on what our name should be. Uh, started with, you know, Anchorage's Anchorage Organizing Committee, but it really is at the uh, Alaska's Winter Game. And so we, after a couple of renditions, we, we came back around to our, our actual name, the uh, Anchorage Exploratory Committee. Uh, but the theme is our time, me, the theme for the event is our dream, our time. And we think that has a lot of legs uh, from a marketing perspective. Um, our dream, our time, it gives uh, the residents a sense of, of, you know, this belongs to them. They can endorse it. It's, uh, uh, it's our time. We came so close. One of the things Matt contributed uh, in the discussion is, you know, people don't really remember how close we came before. You know, one vote away uh, in 98, and, and, and that was, you know, when people hear that story, uh, then they, they realize, oh, we could do it again. And we were so close. So, so that's the idea, is our dream, our time. We uh, put some boards together. There's two versions of the, of the logo. And um, this is that same uh, iconic symbol from before. Um, so depending on your, your application. So, so, yeah, well, comments, anyone? Yeah, I'd love yeah. some feedback. I, I think we need to go new. I mean, that that was a logo that was in existence for 
gosh, over a dozen years active out there. And I think if this is a new effort and a new dream, I think we need to, I think we need to think, think new. I mean, I, I like that logo, but it's, it, I just didn't have to, well, I don't know who designed it or whatever, but I think it's dated, yeah. quite frankly. I mean, the fire and ice theme has been used many, many times over the course of different winter events in the, in the ensuing decades. So, um, I don't know, it just seems to me that this is our dream, let's come up with our look. And well, the, I think there's a lot of value in that. Uh, and so that version on the right, in fact, we tried even downplaying it smaller, making it smaller instead of the version on the left, uh, where it's, it's much bigger. So, so we, we share the same concern that it does look a little dated. Um, <clears throat> I like the theme, though. Our, our dream, our time. I think that's a really powerful statement. I like mm -hmm. that. Yes, I like the theme. Um, so the question becomes, as an exploratory committee, who's only going to have a shelf life of you know, another um, 60 to 90 days, um, do, we, do we need a logo for 60 or 90 days? Or once the report comes forward and it's a go or no go, at that stage, then we're organizing. We're moving into the organizing committee realm. And at that stage, yeah, you got to have, you got to have all the stuff. At, at that point, I absolutely agree. That would be vet branding and Alaska uh, destination uh, branding. But at this this stage, uh, uh, we were thinking that refresh would work. But I'd love to explore that further. We could maybe. Yeah. Well, it goes back to what I mentioned. You know, when Levi was reporting that we can't get too far ahead of ourselves because hey, we don't have the money to do it. Um, we don't have assembly approval to spend $130,000 on something that they basically have not bought into yet. And that's why the role of the Exploratory Committee was research and report and not really start um, doing things as if we're an organizing committee. We've got to really make sure we don't cross that line because we'll get political blowback um, that I don't think any of us wants to be involved in. It's just uh, this has got to be clean all the way uh, without any, any taint that is you, know, you, you spend a lot of money, and well, so if you spend a lot of money and decide not to go, you'll be criticized for that. If you spend a lot of money and decide to go, but it wasn't politically um, approved going forward, then so I, anyway, I'm just saying um, I like you know all the things, but I think our timeline just needs to move back a little bit. Um, so so are, are we are we looking to do any? Um, I, I mark maybe marketing is not the right word, but get this momentum out prior to an announcement of what we're doing or or no because I think that was part of the discussion with on the marketing committee was you know maybe getting the word out of, of what's coming down the pipe of, of Mayor Sullivan making a decision about this but maybe there's maybe that's maybe we we're wrong I mean maybe we're looking to make the get this this um, I don't know get get some momentum behind it after you make your announcement I think it has to be in that timeline. There's things we can do. Obviously, you know, social media is not something that is hugely expensive. I mean, nowadays, a great way to inform people about what the committee is doing and what the goals are. Mm -hmm. um, I think if we could get um, the TV stations to show the film that we saw at the very first committee meeting, I mean, that's a very inspirational thing, and it's a, it shows the history. Like we talked about how close we came, and I mean, it's just I think it's. And you watch that thing, and you just get a chill up your leg, like Chris Matthews, I guess. But it's a um, so. I mean, that's my feeling. I mean, at this stage, we just can't spend a ton of money until we know that we're going forward. Mm -hmm. It's just I just don't see how we would justify it. I think uh, on the committee level, the thought was that uh, uh, we would do a small awareness campaign. And just sort of that, so that when we did come out as a committee and announced that the bid was going to happen, that there would be some sense of this is an, a real opportunity. So that, that's the goal of a TV spot. And um, uh, Levi will correct you, it wasn't a $130,000 spot, it's, it's a low budget awareness spot. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, and then um, when the announcement comes out, uh, there will be some some basic awareness of, of uh, the opportunity. And then when we do do the announcement, um, I think it will be important to really control expectations at that point. And, and we need to be ready to go with a video that talks about 
the venues and the and the opportunity and what lies ahead so that we control those sound sound bites and that that discussion we're prepared to have a website just a, a shell of one that sort of gives a sense and the confidence that it's a it's an organization that's organized and and uh, thoughtful in in the approach so uh, that's a um, planning right now uh, of that project is uh, by the end of the year we'll have some sense of a of a of a site up so um, those are things I think that go a long way with building that confidence that this is a real serious effort and um, I think will help with fundraising and help with mm -hmm. obviously we just have to time it but right now we're an exploratory committee all we're doing is exploring we're not promoting we're not developing we're not um, building enthusiasm. We're just basically going to prepare a report that says this is something we feel very confident we can do. And then, you know, we've got to think about then how, how do we handle that announcement. I mean, I can't unilaterally say we're going to host the games. I mean, I'm just, just one, one politician. I mean, again, your local assembly has to um, be briefed on what the exploratory committee's results are. Um, I could see them passing a resolution of support to go forward, um, which would then authorize us to um, maybe spend some initial capital, but then obviously the organizing committee needs to be formed and the fundraising started, um, because again, I, I just don't think we would have authorization to spend um, tens of thousands of dollars until the assembly buys in with a resolution based on the, the committee's recommendation. It's just, I think we're just a little, a little ahead of the timeline. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Well, because I don't know where the money would come from, Lori. I mean, we have a budget for you know my various departments, but this would be new to the assembly, and if they haven't bought in, it, it'll go sour. So there's at least five people on the assembly at any given time that um, are just anti everything. So, which is true. It's a, yes, I uh, agree wholeheartedly. Um, I believe that the purpose of this committee is to deliver a sound argument for or against uh, to you for your review and your vetting you know, between uh, some assembly members and yourself and you know I think that um, you know that's the first bridge we have to cross and <clears throat> I don't think we can um, underestimate the need for that to be based on solid information and facts and um, verifiable information that you, know, you can use as a uh, justification for whichever decision you make. Um, and I think once that decision is made to, to go forward, I think there'll be plenty of time for fundraising, for marketing, um, and all of that. <coughs> The only thing you'd have to do the next day is have a volunteer sign up because people are going to want to volunteer the minute they hear that there would be any sort of an effort to bid the games. But as long as you capture that information, I think everything else can come in time. Um, we had much the same issue with the AOC. It was a uh, steering committee and just looking into it and a lot of time and energy was spent going visiting the USOC, going uh, to Calgary, bringing uh, Bill Pratt, the executive director of the Calgary Organizing Committee to Anchorage, uh, conversations with um, um, some international, <clears throat> internationally connected uh, sports people, and nothing really happened until uh, the USOC indicated that they wanted a candidate, and then the lever was pulled, the organization was formed into a nonprofit, and we immediately went forward to you know, producing a bid. So I, I think you have great precedent for your approach. Yeah, I just, uh, we just have to, baby steps at this stage. And, and one of the reasons why, too, is that we don't really know, as you said, you know, that the USOC is looking for a candidate yet. So right. um, we don't want to do too much prematurely and then find out, oh, by the way, we're not really interested in pursuing 2026. So that's it. But I like the enthusiasm out of the marketing committee and the finance committee because that's what it's going to take once we do say yay or nay. It's going to 
that that would just start rippling, I think. And, and then, um, and then the transition, as you mentioned, I mean, this exploratory committee essentially dissolves at that stage. Um, the organizing committee then gets formed with their board of directors, and you know, whether or not the includes all of the, all of this group or uh, this group plus a dozen others. Who knows? We'll figure all that out, and that's where yourself and Chris and you can really help us with that kind of organization on how it worked and what was the best format. Um, and then, you know, if Chris, for whatever reason, um, is unable to replicate the nonprofit, it's not a hard thing to start a new nonprofit and, and just start fresh and, and go from there. So, um, so the, but this gives us a template for when we do decide Mm -hmm. To go, it's just uh, it just, we just have to back up the timeline a little bit. So, All right events. Who's reporting them? Um, Jim, do you want to since our other committee chairs are absent? Well, we only have one uh, venues and events committee meeting and one last week at the camp. We really didn't talk too much about events. We we concentrated more on venues. Uh, and as we talked, you know those. Those are intertwined. Yes. And you can't have a, an event without a venue. Yeah. Yeah. We've um, obviously got some very good ski facilities at uh, Kincaid. Uh, we've had some national class competitions there. We have not had an uh, international event there, World Cup, since 1983. And that new biathlon facility is, could certainly host some, uh, probably, I should say, probably could host some international maybe even a World Juniors, World Cup, it probably would require some more tree clearing for television coverage because that's what they require. Um, cost for those events, don't know. They're not, not cheap. Um, but those would be some international type events. James, can you think of any others we could do? It would have been nice to host a World Cup, but especially when Keegan was still competing, but or is still competing, but you'd have to get into that um, bring it two to three years out. Uh, for a World Cup ski race. The time to host that, I believe, is in March, which is traditionally a tough time to get um, one of the International World Cups. They would have said, well, December's available. I don't think that's the best time to bring people up and showcase Alaska. Uh, there, there, is, there is interest from the international community to come have World Cups in, in North America. There was some in, in Canada last year, in Eastern Canada. And in Calgary, too. Great reception. Yep. And, and in Camorra, outside Calgary. Um, there's a bid for a, a group working on bringing some races to a major city in either Northeast or Chicago, potentially, um, for 2015. Um, I think, I think the, the FIS would, would, and would welcome a strong bid from, from us to, uh, to host a World Cup. So that's an interesting question. If we obviously in meeting up, we decide to go you know, on hosting significant events, you know, whether or not the organizing committee could help finance those events as part of strengthening the bid, um, you know, and using the auspices of the organizing committee to to assist with that, or whether they can stand on their own just because they're such significant events anyway. Well, I think any help an organizing committee would be because that's what the AOC was able to do for the World Junior Alpine Championships and the World uh, Junior Hockey Championships, and, uh, uh, and um, there would that would be so significant they, because the Nordic Ski Association APU that's that's a big hosting a World Cup would be a big thing for them to take on. In '83 we did it, but it's they've gotten significantly more complex and expensive since then. So it would be an appropriate role for the organizing committee to help build the resume, if you will. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And we can look into some other events as well. Um, uh, I don't think we could host any sort of World Cup speed skating event at uh, Cuddy Park. We might be able to host some more national or maybe North American type events there. Maybe a Junior World Cup. Um, Alyeska, of course, has hosted some of the Alpine events in the past. Uh, we just had the FIS races. It uh, was a very popular uh, location for the U.S. National Alpine Championships uh, in three times in the last 12 years. Uh, I don't know if they're talking about coming back up anytime soon because we did host three times in about an eight-year period. 
That's good. It's already on the resume then. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. But for other things like freestyle, um, we don't have the venue for an aerials or a moguls. Uh, the uh, snowboarding, we've not hosted any major snowboarding events. And I don't think we could do a half pipe because we don't have what the size of super pipe. Uh, might be able to do a parallel uh, giant slalom, that, which is the uh, event Rosie uh, meddled in. Uh, bobsled and luge, those are obviously out since we don't have those. Um, another major hockey event. When you say they're out, you mean you'd have to build venues? Yes, we'd have to build a venue to do that. Uh, Nordic combined, we were missing a 90 meter jump. So, but if we were to have a 90 meter jump, we could host Nordic combined events and we could also host the World Junior Championships. Uh, How big is our current jump? 70? 60. 60. Yeah, we have a 40 and a 60. That's a hilltop. <coughs> What's that? And that's a hilltop. That's a hilltop. Yeah. Is there room there? I've asked the uh, folks up there uh, if there is room to put the bigger jumps in next next door, and uh, there would have to be significant dirt work and uh, uh, tower construction, mm -hmm. but uh, they're looking into it to see if it could work. And Ron Shudan was looking into it as well. Uh, Ron was put together the uh, technical bid for uh, AOC uh, in 89. And I got a piece in Scottsdale. I got hold of him for this for the winter. Got a hold of him, and um, he's looking for some of his old, old information. But there is room land-wise. It just takes some construction. We think so. I think that's all meeting land there. Um, okay, well, on your one location number one for ski jumping, you got Highland Road. Yeah, and actually, that that we can now rule out. So I talked to Ron about that, and because of the construction of the Highland Road exit, that cut off the bottom here. So that one's no longer good. You can't jump over the highway. <laughs> <laughs> there yeah, but it's not pretty. <laughs> there might be some other uh, spots. Uh, John Rada suggested Arctic Valley. I think <coughs> the upper part of it where the existing ski area is, I don't think that would be a practical location. There's uh, some other land uh, behind uh, um, uh, Perry McDonald that might be suitable. And then uh, Eagle River Valley might have some areas as well. Uh, we looked into the government peak area, but a ski jump has to be oriented either north or east. And most of the stuff up in uh, the valley has is, got the wrong orientation. It may be able to orient it west, which is the current orientation of the Carlisle jumps. Um, but we, we're trying to find that out, it's, that out as well. Why, why do they do that? Because if you jump in the afternoon, the sun's in your eyes? And well, the, the sun will affect the, the in run and the jumping hill. It'll start melting it out. All the steamboat hill, the Lake Placid jump, they're all, they're all facing east. Gotcha. What was the location in the, sorry, in the previous bit? What was the ski jump location? It was Highland Road. It was Highland Road, and it, it was a north facing. Yeah. Yeah, so the Salt Lake jumps are oriented north as well. <coughs> Well, uh, just one thing I would keep in mind that um, for the opening and closing ceremonies, um, you either have a significant venue that you have to construct or closing ceremonies are generally smaller. Sometimes that can be in a smaller venue, but the opening ceremonies are a big deal. And the ski jump. Uh, was the venue that Lola used, used yeah. and it was brilliant because <coughs> they jumped into it all the way down the mountain and yeah. all the way around it. And it, it was you were at the opening for those, weren't mm -hmm. you? I was at the closing, so yeah, it's, it's a so it's a, it's a good facility to that to, you can put thousands of people. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. That's a good thought. Oh, mm -hmm. so stadium, stadium or something, yeah. Mm -hmm. Lola was probably a good example to really. Go off. It was my understanding that they tried to do the most eco-friendly games. Everything could be taken apart. The trays and the cafeterias were all fiber, so that they would all uh, dissolve. And it just was. They sounded like they kind of had a good handle on all that. Well, and th there was one other aspect of those games that I think shouldn't be lost on, on our planning, and that is they were in such a tight circle 
Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, when you start going outside of an hour from Olympic Village or you know the, the center of, of town, and you start lessening the desirability of the bin. Yes. And that's actually one of the things we talked about too, is that to um, uh, yeah, go with obviously Anchorage, but also include the valley in that, and that's where we thought that the speed skating, the speed skating venue has to be enclosed. It has to be an indoor facility now. And uh, that's where we have uh, Palmer, I think, lo listed for that. Yeah, but there might be some possibilities up at the fairgrounds. Hmm. Um, and there will also be some need for some other alpine development. Hatcher Pass has been on the drawing board for a long time. Actually, the one that's not on here uh, that we should add is Glacier Winter Creek. I would I would move that into the uh, and that's up valley from from um, uh, Girdwood. Mm -hmm. And that's all uh, heritage land bank or state land. And actually I've got some maps of that I can bring in our next venues and event committee meeting. Is that included in the Girdwood 2020s? Yes it is. Uh, is, other, is that where they train now? I mean uh, they have a snowcat operation, Glacier Winter Creek, mm -hmm. but they, um, there's no other access other than snowcat. Okay. And then, of course, Government Peak, Hatcher Pass, that's another, you know, another alpine area that could be potentially uh, uh, developed. Uh, another possible site for cross country. Kincaid's obviously our, our flagship for Nordica Biathlon, but the Government Peak Rec area is getting developed in uh, uh, at the base of uh, Government Peak, and that's that's got uh, some fantastic terrain, and they've got about 15 kilometers of trail, and have a capability expanded to 40 to 50. What about um, Bicentennial Park? Uh, uh, the trail system. I mean, that's that's something that I think we would we would need to look at um, for some snowmaking reasons as well. They've got a natural water source. Um, Kincaid has some well issues, um, and they've got the train for it. So, yeah. and that's one thing, one thing to keep in mind too is that any um, cross country biathlon trails they all have to have snowmaking. That's that's a requirement now. You said they do have a water source there, so you could make snow if you needed mm -hmm. it. Natural. Yeah. 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 Oh, we've got a trail system out there, obviously not designed for, for races, but it's an intro, you know, start. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then there's this Chester Creek Sports Complex uh, that um, John brought up, of which is, uh, I guess, is on the drawing boards. It is, and are you familiar with what? What the plan is about moving Mulcahy Park to the west, yeah, mm -hmm. and then having continuous parking between Mulcahy and the arena, so that uh, you don't have this hodgepodge of mm -hmm. parking pockets, if you will. And, um, and it's getting to the point too that with uh, virtually every school now having their own turf field, whether or not the Anchorage um, football stadium would still be needed for for that use, or you know it could certainly be covered or be part of the complex. I don't know. But it's got a lot of potential down. There's a lot of room. Mm -hmm. Who's working on that the concept? Well, the, um, it's in our legislative package, but uh, the sports mafia guys, Nerland, Winchester, <laughs> um, Shake. That's, uh, that was actually discussed in the finance meeting as well with Don. Um, and he said that he was going to be meeting periodically with the um, important people in charge of that and bring up the idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It, it just sort of became a what if conversation, right. you know, what mm -hmm. if we um, could they, uh, tear down and recreate that, you know, in a perfect world with a new ice facility and lots of storage and incorporate a speed skating oval um, and just maximize that footprint um, for multi-season use. I think we're still a little unclear how many sheets of ice we're going to need. Uh, both for hockey and uh, uh, speed skate. When we know we need a full one for speed skating. Uh, it's just, James said some stuff out that uh, the Vancouver Games used uh, one arena for figure skating and for short track speed skating. 
so. Oh, they, they shared in the arena. Yeah, they shared in the arena. Well, they're, they're different times. Yeah. yeah. So they get the short tracks, short first tracks, tracks early. Yeah. Figure skating to second skating. Yeah. Gotcha. That works. <laughs> uh, let's just throw out here real quick. We did uh, include Fairbanks in a couple of these discussions, although um, I think we found that the USSC and IOC weren't crazy about 45 the distance there. Each yeah. Way. Yeah. <laughs> we, went, we went through that exercise <laughs> last time. Yeah, we did. Well, it's, a, it's a nice thing to include them it's symbolically, if nothing else, and if it doesn't work out, you know, at least at the start you're getting buy-in because there's the potential that no, Fairbanks could be included. Yeah. I think it's a nice gesture. It uh, yeah. created expectations of back to the <laughs> that's, I think, last yeah, time. It, it created cool. expectations and a lot of hard feelings. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. We had to. Well, Anchorage letting Fairbanks down again, that's kind of. <laughs> <laughs> is that a problem? Yeah. 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 We better go some Fair, from Fairbanks so we, uh, we can get to pick on them. Now. Well, and uh, I can remember when the, that rivalry was so fierce because we were small. Now, we're no. so big we don't even recognize it. Would Mulcahy, um, you know, a, a new Mulcahy be big enough to hold opening ceremonies as well? Well, it would be significant they will build up. I mean, it, it just depends what the concept is. You had, you've seen, um, you know, Little Hummer was pretty small. I'm not sure on the total number there. On For Vancouver, I think the opening ceremony stadium held 18,000. 18. Mm -hmm. So it just, in, I think in in in, in uh, Torino is even bigger. They've got a, you know, um, the Italian soccer team there. So so they use yeah. the eighty thousand person stadium. So it just oh. depends on the concept, really. Okay. Um, we didn't want to leave out the peninsula either. So on the El El Chetty trails were also Teshi. Sal Teshi, yeah. Okay. Were also mentioned as a po possible location for uh, uh, possibly biathlon. So, uh, so that's kind of it in a nutshell. Definitely cross off that Highland Road one because that's that's no that's longer good. Okay. possible. And then the Paralympics, do they typically use the same facilities? Just different timing. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. So we got special events: 2,500 athletes, 2,500 media. Is that typical numbers for? Mm -hmm. One of the real differences, your, your locker rooms, you really have to make sure that you, you've got the special accommodations on the Paralympic side, mm -hmm. or so than just your standard, which you do, what you would use for the other. Good point. Okay, very good. Thanks, Jim. <coughs> um, and then, who will, um, who is this report from? Is this from Carol? Um, it is. Levi's presenting on her behalf. Second half. Very good. Double duty for um, the accommodation and transportation committee has met a couple times, uh, mainly just going down the list of um, questions asked by the IOC in their packet um, and, and trying to, you know, fill in the blanks there. So some of the things that we've come to, and, and if you have specific questions about these, I'm going to defer. Um, Carol is the expert in this area. but. But basically, uh, when Anchorage bid the games in 92, it had 3,500 hotel rooms. Uh, today, it has nearly 9,000. 1,000 dorm rooms, 300 registered bed and breakfasts. Um, and if we project out to 2026, you know, that number can jump to 11,000 hotel rooms in the municipality of Anchorage. And just for a teaser there for hotels, the associate rates are between 600 and 1,000 a night for a hotel room. So if we up the bed tax a little bit, we will come with bed rates. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. So we double dip on them. Um, we're still working on a few on a few things in in the lodging area, which is uh, determining how they're categorizing beds per room because they they are saying the terminology there of what they're asking is is kind of confusing because they're saying um, rooms, but it sounds like they're counting beds. So we just want to get some clarification on that. Um, and then we also had a few ideas about the apartment buildings uh, in Anchorage, if, if, we can, if those can be utilized as well during that time frame. Also discussing with UAA and APU uh, the displacement of students to utilize um, the university and their housing. And I, I, I think something like that was in the previous bit as well with using the, the university area. Uh, that's correct. We were going to build 
Uh, I think it was approximately 2,000 accommodations for 2,000 athletes mm -hmm. or so. And that would be Olympic Village, basically. That would be the Olympic Village, and then <coughs> afterwards it would be university housing. Right, okay. Now it's university housing first. And well, that, that is another way of looking at not having to build a, a bunch of things. I mean, if capacity is there and we have the ability to display students for a certain amount of time and we don't have to build new structures, it could be a cost savings area as well, as long as they're up to snuff with, with what we're trying to do. On the other hand, the university master plan is that they want to increase the number of, uh, they like to increase by a thousand mm -hmm. um, the accommodations on campus for students. So. Maybe there's a nice meld there between mm -hmm. their objectives and being able to turn it over to them once we use it. How many beds do we need? I mean, on average, I don't have that. I'm not sure that they put a guideline for the amount of hotel beds in there. They just want to have an idea of what you have. So what we've been doing is looking back at the previous Olympics, and Sochi will be really telling about what they have. Um, for us to base off, but I don't have that information right now. So is the 2,500 athlete number about right? Mm -hmm. That came out of the Vancouver games, <clears throat> and they tried to hold that number pretty um, steady. Yeah. yeah, pretty steady, even with the addition of new sports. Because yeah, they're not letting quite as many athletes per country compete in a given event anymore. Right? It's gone from four. Take it from one sport to give yeah. two. So are the thousand dorm rooms all at UAA? And slash APU? Yes. Yeah. Well, UAA. And so they want another thousand within the next <coughs> eight years or so. Yes, yeah, so there's currently a thousand dorm rooms. I'm sure you could have double occupancy. Double occupancy. Mm -hmm. Shoot, that might be that might be just what we need. So yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things that could fall right in line with what the direction the IOC is trying to go, which is and the USOC for that matter. Um, trying to save money on infrastructure and, and create a more affordable Olympics. So moving down transportation, we tried to get an idea of where we were at motor coach wise because I know that's going to be a, a big need and not only having them here but also coordinating the, the movement of them through town and to different events. Um, in 2014, you know, in a month or so, uh, it looks like we're going to have 255 coaches totaling 13,070 seats. And that is all of the companies that are located in Alaska. Um, I know Carol had brought up the fact that a lot of companies will bring buses up here for the uh, summer season. And that could be something where we talk to them if more motor coaches are needed, which I think there will be more probably needed um, to work something out, either storing them up here after the summer to, or, or bringing them up early for that venue and then storing them until the summer gets here so they don't have to pay for transport back and forth. So those are things that we've, we've been discussing. Uh, we also got an idea of uh, Premier's um, rail cars as well as Han Holland America um, and Princess, and there's 24 rail cars totaling just over 2,000 seats right now. We thought that rail would be kind of a unique way to transport people from Anchorage to Girdwood. Um, and even if the valley is utilized, it stops right there at the state fairgrounds. So um, certainly not fair ranks. I mean, that <coughs> takes you a day to get there. But uh, I think rail would be a, a unique way to transport people and, and probably uh, alleviate some of the congestion that will happen on the Seward Highway. Yeah, that's great. Um, Plus, you could, um, you could entertain on a rail car. So. You can cocktail them up. So <laughs> <laughs> Yep, that's, that's another thing. We can hammer them with uh, additional rail taxes there, too. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> so the rail we're just working on um, more of a commuter line between the, here and the valley, too. Yeah. And doing that, we're doing a lot of track straightening and trying to get the speeds and the time, time compressed a bit. We've actually talked about, about um, including a, an additional stop at the Diamond Center or in that area. Um, just brainstorming of, of an area where it's close to ample parking and, and anything like that. And people could hop on and take it to Girdwood. Um, very cool. Mm -hmm. So we still have a few things that we're, we're trying to find out. How many school buses are available? Um, because that's another way to transport, you know, athletes or, or pedestrians or who, whomever. 
Um, People Movers was another one just to see what their schedules were, how many buses are available. Obviously, all of that's going to be thrown out of whack during the Olympic time because there's going to be um, escorts going, <coughs> going every direction, so coordinating with um, People Mover. Um, and then getting solid numbers for capacity of the Alaska Railroad. Yeah, I don't know how far you guys probably had a fleshed out traffic plan, but uh, you know there's going to be great demand to go see events and and having a rock solid traffic plan because mm -hmm. otherwise you could have you could have a nightmare gridlock. And, but, yeah. Well, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, I think was discussed, uh, an idea that Calgary had is yeah, everybody that has buses is usually trading them out or upgrading them. And so they asked them to hang on to capacity uh, for a little bit longer and order the new ones a little bit sooner so that they double effectively up. doubled them up and then uh, mm -hmm. planned. Okay. Good idea. Um, That's interesting. So if you're looking to upgrade anyway, just hang on to the old ones. <laughs> right. Or well, you know, people mover, for example. Um, you know, just hang on to the older buses for a little bit longer. It's a little more maintenance, but it gives you that capacity uh, that you need for that two mm -hmm. three weeks. Well, and it gives them more the ability for more revenue too for them. I mean, it's in their best interest to keep it in that return. So the next thing was the. Uh, the airport, of course, we, we know that we're a, a huge international hub. Actually, backing up to transportation, the other benefit of the railroad, railroad is it has the ability to go right into the airport as well to pick people up. So um, moving forward, in, in 2025, the forecast predicts a two point, just over 2.9 million um, employments. That term I'm actually not familiar with, but I assume that's um, the amount of, of turnover for uh, traffic coming through um, and Anchorage would grow from 5 million anticipated passengers to 6 between now and 2026. Um, again, the MAP term was one that I wasn't really familiar with at that point. Um, that's You're going to learn a lot in this job. Yeah, I tell you what, I'm <laughs> expanding my boundaries. <laughs> So to give you an annual equivalent of, of 10 to 15 million total passengers, which is um, easily capable for us to handle during a two-week crush or two-week demand crush, I'm mean, just getting hammered with that many people. The capacity for the airport, it's it's almost no a non-event. Particularly during that time frame, it's mm -hmm. not summer where tourist season's right. high. And, and I'm going to tell you the work they did at the airport, the remodel. I mean, it's as nice an airport as anywhere. Mm -hmm. so, a tremendous job out there. Yeah. Well, the other thing you have to remember is that in the 80s we had 13 carriers here, uh, between two and three landings a day, uh, all of them white bodies, um, and, and we had tremendous. I mean, we probably have equal landings or greater landings now, but a lot of that's cargo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, before we had all those people coming in and shopping duty free for an hour and a half and getting back on the airplane. Right. It was just duty free in the world, I think. Number it was two. Yeah, number two. Yeah, yeah. it's amazing. Oh, wow. yeah. Isn't that something? Yeah, Saipan. That, that was a real eye opener and a really good selling po point for us last time when mm -hmm. you know, they realized how close we were because of the polar routes to all all of Europe and Asia. And that great photo you had of the, all the different tails with their Lufthansa and all the uh, all the different airlines. Yeah, yeah, and that's the that's the other part of this that she wrote a paragraph about. Um, but the the proximity of us to, to all these different airports. I mean, now with the triple seven, hell, you get direct flights from all over the world to Anchorage, or you have the ability of having that, even if they're special for... We'll take another shot of all the tails, but we won't show them it's a cargo airplane. We'll just show them. <laughs> <laughs> just the tails. Yeah. 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 It's a Russian nipple or ice cutters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a... So that, that basically sums up what we're, we're trying to come to a conclusion of, of all the questions that the IOC will be asking of us. Uh, should we move down that path? Yeah, and then we'll use Sochi again to 
to give us our goals for the amount of beds and the amount of the type of transportation. You know, I was wondering if Sochi is going to be a good mo a good barometer because yeah. I think it's a really unusual Olympics. And yeah, it's really the, expensive. I think the Toronto, yeah. Vancouver, and yeah. Albano ones are going to be more relevant. I don't know. It's the gut feelings. Mm -hmm. It's Russia. It's yeah. I think Vancouver um, turnout-wise will probably be a good comparison for us as well. Um, in the neighborhood. Yeah, and so the amount of people that attended that, I can't imagine we're going to be far off from, from that, but, you know, um, it could be more because a lot of people haven't been to Alaska and I'll give them a, a better reason to come. Yeah. Cool. So, of course, I was put a positive spin on it. Cause and, you know, um, one of the things that, you know, that in our report, we want to just make sure we include, again, not only the uh, particular types of races that we've held, but with the Special Olympics World Winter Games, which was thousands of athletes, the uh, party winter games, a couple thousand athletes, and we've had the capability to do it on a um, on a numbers game, but not particularly the, the requirements type um, that, that the Olympics require. So it's a, uh, we know we can do it uh, at least in numbers of athletes, but right? the game, it's, it's without a race is significantly. So. Yeah. Well, and we kind of talked about it, sorry to interrupt, but we kind of talked about it in the marketing meeting that, you know, the Olympic Games is an ultimate goal to, to host, but if we can use this process to to help catapult Anchorage into a new level of being a destination for winter sports in general, um, you know, we've basically accomplished our goal. And I know we talked, you, you talked about that in the in the first meeting, sir, Rick. Um, but even using the AOC or whatever that committee is to, you know, expand awareness of the probability of Alaska being a major host of, of any of these World Cups or anything, I think, I think is possible. And, maybe even more probable than the Olympics if the Olympics is, is a stretch for us right now. Well, but. How many people here, I know I sent it to you, how many people here have heard of the Youth Olympic Games? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And that's that's a possibility that we might really want to look at. It's, I looked at the, uh, it's um, smaller, shorter time period, you don't need as fancy a, a venues. In fact, I think we've gone almost everything, except the bob and luge and the jump. Um, we obviously have to enhance everything we have, but um, they only held one of them so far for winter, but they've held several for summer. Uh, yeah, I mean, any event like that that helps put Alaska and Anchorage specifically on the map, I think will be helpful. I This is a stretch because it's a bigger event, but even X Games, I mean, I don't know where we fall in that, but they do the X Games, the winter version of that. I think Vail has it for the last three years, and it's we're probably a little late to bid for the next one, but that's an event that's not quite the level of the Olympics, but it's it's something that that helps. I mean, I know it's a different direction, um, but... Part of the Olympics. What? The Olympic sports now. Yeah, well, I guess I, well, and that's true. The, the <laughs> overall extreme. <laughs> extreme. Yeah. Except that they snow, snow, machine. snow machine uh, flip thing. Yeah, yeah. They, they took that one out. They did? Yeah, after yeah, last year. Oh, they yeah, took that out. I died. Uh, the other one is the World University Games, which I guess mm -hmm. is going on right now. Yeah. So a list of yeah. those, a list of those type of events, mm -hmm. would be nice for us to know, so we can. You know, back when Bill Elander was uh, was here and running the the, uh, the convention bureau, convention bureau, I sat down. I worked on a project for him for three or four months, and I tried to identify all the different uh, NGBs and all the different events and things. Um, I'll touch base with Julie because I, I I know they they probably still have that document that would would kind of help. Yeah. The, the, Realistically, the, the bigger difference that we've got to look at, especially when looking at the, at the venues, is the, the changes that have been made on the media side and their requirements are so much different than they were 20 years ago. Um, and that's probably the bigger thing that we've got to look at. And I think as, as long as we take that into to effect, then, then we'll be fine because you're not just looking at you know, a, a hockey facility or a biathlon range or whatever, it's, it's all down to camera angles and what they can do and, and that, that's that's a big chunk of it this, this time around, so. That's a good point. Is there any chance uh, Anchorage could do the Arctic Winter Games again? I don't see that happening for another 10 to 12 years. Mm -hmm. it, it'll only come to Alaska every 10 or 12 years, but, but realistically, the only other spots um, you know, when Fairbanks just bid on it, they were the only ones that bid. Uh, Juno had, had looked at it, and the Valley had looked at it. Um, 
kind of bless their hearts when they, um, the Arctic Winter Games International Committee went to visit Juno, this was, oh gosh, eight, ten years ago, um, pouring rain in the middle of winter, and it was, uh, there was no snow to be seen anywhere, and the committee just kind of said, eh, maybe not. And so. <laughs> the more recent time they tried to go, they had one of those situations where they went through Sitka, and it took them a few days to get there, so. But, yeah, yeah, I don't no. think it's going to happen, you know. Uh, realistically, the the next spot that they probably would target would be the valley, to be honest with you. Um, well, I know the last time we hosted them was 74, and I mm -hmm. seem to recall after, after that, they said Anchorage is too big, we're never going to come back here. But they like things them. change. Yeah. I, you well, know, that's why we did Chugat Eagle River, though. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That's Anchorage. Mm -hmm. but the only thing is, what, what's going to happen, though, is in, deny it. In, uh, <laughs> in, six, in 16, when it goes to Greenland, it's going to be a reduced number of games. 16's games and 18's games are going to be a reduced number of, of uh, um, events. You're not going to have the 22, 23 events or, or sports. You're going to be down at, at the 16, 17 level. So maybe they'll be ready then to bounce it back yeah, up to a better place that yeah. can handle everything. So and that's 2,000 athletes. Well, Fairbanks is going to be 2,000 athletes. Yeah, we're, we're like 2,100. Yeah, so. Very cool. Well, we're exceeded our time by being able to any final comments wrap up um yeah i just uh, heard this morning my visa for sochi has come through excellent yeah, yeah. so excellent. i was, was going to break my heart if it didn't come through i'm uh, not paying six hundred dollars a night but uh, <laughs> <laughs> actually looking for anyone who wants to join me on this to split the cost <laughs> uh, and uh i will uh while I'm over there, I'll get in touch beforehand. I know a couple of guys who are on the executive team with uh, the United States Olympic Committee, the guys I uh, raced with and against back in the 70s and 80s, and I'll see if I can, I can get in to see them. But it's it's always really crazy. It's it's hard to yeah. hard to connect. Probably uh, <coughs> connect you with Anita. Okay. Yep. Okay. Cool. Anybody else? Final thoughts? Appreciate all the hard work. I this is progress. We've. Uh, We've got some <coughs> goals and um, inching towards uh, you know, probably making a good thoughtful decision here in a few months. So thanks, everybody.